But ultimately, when you're in the role of sheriff, the buck stops with you. Heidi, welcome to Meet the Voter, and this is sponsored by the RMC and their silver sponsors. We want to thank the RMC, and I want to thank you for showing up. And I know you're running for office. This is more than you run for a sheriff's office, but we're going to talk to you today about some different elements. And first of all, we want to find out um, what your background is, where you grew up, and what did you do in law enforcement? Okay. Well, uh, I was born in Oakland, California, but I moved up here when I was 13 years old. Uh, my father's company, which actually built bar and wine equipment, so electronics, he was head of refrigeration for a company called Electronic Dispensers International. They relocated to Reno because of uh, the advantages of warehousing taxes. And that's kind of how I landed in Reno. I grew up in uh, the North Valleys and I went to high school at Proctor R. Hug. And as I went through my life and tried to figure out what I was going to do with it. I ended up uh, starting off working as a public servant at the county library, shelving books in high school. Then I went into banking. And then I discovered I wanted something more out of my life. I didn't know what that was going to be. And one day I saw an ad on TV for the Reno Police Department when they were doing the Safety 88 Tax Initiative. And they said, women and minorities encouraged to apply. And I said, ooh, I'm one of those. So maybe I should uh, look into that. And that's kind of how my path in law enforcement started. So I became a reserve police officer with Reno PD in 1988. And then as I moved through, I became a full-time officer with Reno PD, went through the academy with them. And then it was difficult back then. There were very few women in law enforcement. And at Reno PD, out of 313, 13 were female. And I said, you know, I don't know if I really fit into this culture here at the time. And I started looking around and the county was hiring at the time. I said, I wonder what that would be like. So I ended up uh, applying for the county for the sheriff's office and I became a deputy sheriff over there. And I loved it. There are a lot more women with the sheriff's office than there were with Reno or Sparks. There are also a lot more uh, opportunities in the sheriff's department, aren't there? It's, uh, it's more diverse. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do. Everything from you know, working in the jail, working on the road, detectives. Uh, we have people in the crime lab. We have search and rescue functions. Right. We have the service of civil process and subpoenas. Uh, bailiffs at district court. It kind of goes you on and around. on and on. Sort of yeah. like the military. You do a lot of different jobs. You could reinvent around. yourself constantly. <laughs> And always end up back at the jail. Right. I've met a couple of folks and they said, yeah, I'm ready to go back to the jail <laughs> when they get older. You know, a lot of streets. people give, give the jail a bad rap, but it's a great world. I've loved yeah. working in the jail. It must be interesting. We'll have you back for a, an, another interview later on and we'll talk more about some of those experiences in the jail. Absolutely. So going, driving on, you have many years. Um, it sounds like you went to post more than once too. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> You went to post a couple times. Did you go with the the LA or with the uh, PD and the sheriff? Did you have to go twice? So I was really good at going to academies <laughs> for a while. Uh, I went through a reserve academy when I was brand new with, with that, and then I actually went through a second reserve academy because at the time you had the ability to potentially challenge the post exam for the state of Nevada, and and utilize that as a way to get your foot in the door for full time experience. So I had just finished my second reserve academy and then I got hired full-time by Reno PD. So then I went through another full academy. So that's reserve. three already. Was the reserve more difficult or was the uh, PD more difficult than the reserve? It was just back longer. Then? It was okay. very similar, but just longer. Yeah. And then after I left Reno PD and I went over to County, County had their own academy. Wow. So I had four within a very like a two-year window, mm-hmm. two- to three-year window. So Washoe County is pretty much consolidated now with the law enforcement PDs, right? Uh, no. They haven't? No. So uh, when the jail was built in 1988, that became a regional jail. So people from the Sparks Jail, the Reno City Jail, and the Washoe County Sheriff's Office Jail all consolidated. So that was regionalized. But when it comes to law enforcement agencies, you've got the Washoe County Sheriff's Office, you've got the Reno Police Department, mm-hmm. you've got the Sparks Police Department, 
and a lot of other smaller agencies as well. Right. We reach this county goes well north to the border, of course. Correct. Very, very good. So specifically, um, I'm around a lot of young people and I've got a couple daughters and one's a senior at Reno High School and she's looking at from law enforcement to a DA to medical, she's looking at everything right now. What advice would you give young people, and specifically women, um, uh, with considering a, a law enforcement uh, type of work? It can be different things, of course, but what would you tell them when they're in high school? I guess you have to be 21 to be sworn, right? Right. So the first thing that I would say, and, and this is not just for women, this is for young people as a whole. You are responsible for everything that you do and the decisions that you make. And when you're young and inexperienced and naive, you do things that can impact you in your future. So when I, I was actually in charge of recruitment and backgrounds at one point in my career, I also ran the academy. So I was involved in that world and trying to do that recruitment piece. And we would have fantastic people that would get through the physical portion of the test. But when they would get to the background portion, there would be things that would come up and bite them. So number one, be honest. If you, if you make any misgivings in your background process, you're done because we can't tolerate people who are not honest and not trustworthy. The other thing is everything you do from the drugs you take, the fights you get in, who you hang out with, because we have people that say, oh, yeah, I've got roommates in my house and they're committing felony crimes by using illegal drugs and substances, but I don't get in their business. Well, you don't get to live in a home with people committing felony crimes and then become a law enforcement officer. It, you would think it's logic, but people don't necessarily connect the dots. They, they function in their own silo or their own bubble. And they go, oh, yeah. Or, yeah, I said those mean things on Facebook. Right. Or, or on Twitter. Social media now. Right. That must be a complete and, and we do. We look at people's social media to see what kind of posts they have. You know, how would it work if we find out that this person has been on a, a racist rant on social media, but we're going to make them a law enforcement officer? And they're somehow magically supposed to treat everybody fairly and equally. It doesn't work. Right, right. Totally understand. Hey, one quick question. Uh, when they go through the application process, do they take a lie detector test? Uh, it depends on the agency that's hiring them. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was hired, I did go through a lie detector test. Uh, now they use what's called a computerized stress voice analysis machine, and it, it works in a similar way. Yeah, you could. Probably, I know they can actually do that through some of the media that we're using here today. You can right. analyze voice. Right. Very good. They do that in politics at high level now. Oh, nice. I sort of study politics on the side. So what, are, what was the uh, toughest day that you had while in law enforcement? Or toughest days? So uh, early on in my career, I was part of a hostage negotiation team. And one night I was called out um, way, way out in the middle of nowhere, kind of rural Nevada. And a man had violently attacked his wife. So domestic violence ruptured her spleen to a point where she was care flighted, taken to the hospital, out of there. And then he barricaded himself in the house. I arrived, he was firing shots out the window at us to kind of suicide by cop. But then we had to settle in to get him out of that residence without other, other people being harmed. So you have to change hats and build rapport with somebody that maybe you're not so fond of at the time. Uh, they've done horrible acts, violent acts, and you can't let your personal feelings and biases leak through in that conversation or you're not going to be successful in what you're doing. So it was a very difficult day of trying to compartmentalize what you saw, deal with your adrenaline and your emotions, and still have a successful outcome. Oh, very good. So I, and I can imagine, um, just like in the military, it's got to be tough at times in law enforcement. It's not cut for everybody because you do see some really rough things. And, well, how do you put those things behind you? How do you forget about them? You know, you have to find ways, healthy ways uh, of dealing with that. Um, law enforcement, a lot of people don't talk about it, but folks that don't deal with it, there's a very high level of suicide in law enforcement. Yes. Um, there's a lot of substance abuse, particularly alcohol, 
in law enforcement. You know, that's your way of your coping. The legal drug. Yeah, the legal drug, your coping mechanism. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, I like the folks that really focus in on physical fitness. Mm -hmm. You know, finding a way to deal with that stress. And the bigger issue is relying on your family and friends. And a lot of law enforcement officers will have a tendency to gravitate toward people being their friends that are only in law enforcement. And I would highly recommend, if you have the ability, keep your old friends. They'll keep you grounded. Very good, very good. So, and finally, on the first part, I just want to ask you, what, what are your best days in law enforcement? Ah, so one of the best days I had, and it's just a really obscure one, uh, we had a day where the generator at the jail went out. So it's nighttime, it's dark, there's no lights there, no air conditioning, no nothing. And the jail is the only jail in Washoe County, so all arrests have to be booked into it. There was no way we could book anybody. So I get a call at 10 o'clock at night from a captain saying, go create booking down at the courthouse. So I didn't have a whole lot of information. I just had to make it work. And it was reaching out to wonderful people and people who knew their jobs and their great team and saying, I need you to bring this and this and this, getting a hold of the highway patrol at the time and having them bring their mobile breath unit downtown so we could continue to manage DUIs and arrests for DUIs, uh, arranging for people to make calls for bail bonds and finding a way to release them from that location. And it, it was just a very smooth operating machine. And we had a great time. And on top of that, we ordered pizza. Wow. There must... You know, when you think about there, it had to be two failures then. The, you had to lose electricity from your main feeds and the backup had to fail. Correct. No one probably ever plans for that, I would guess. No, it was it was just not a good day for the folks that were up, up at the jail at the time. And I mean, we had to put um, deputies on all the entrances. We had to have emergency lighting and, and flashlights everywhere. And we had deputies with shotguns to make sure that, that we could control the doors. It sounds like that could have been one of your worst days, but turned out to be a good day because right. everything came Well, we out. learned a lot. <laughs> we learned that we needed to uh, test our generator system more often, and we also had to replace the ones that were there. The, right. the warranties weren't cutting it. Very good. So with that, we're going to go to a quick break, and then we're going to come back to your life and success principles and finish up. All right, Heidi, coming back from the break, we want to know what are your life and success principles. We were talking offline. You talked about clear vision, extreme ownership, and honesty. So what does clear vision mean to you? So when you don't have a vision, you don't know where you're going, you're just treading water. And if you see it, it will happen. I, I, I truly believe in that. So if you look down the road and you say, okay, these are, these are achievements, these are the goals I want to have. If you see them, you can visualize them, you can get there. You also need to share it with your people. It can't be a secret and then wonder why you didn't get there. So it's talking with them, sharing with them what's going on, but not only that, engaging them in the process. You need to enable them. You need to give them the power and the time and, and the resources to make that successful. Very good, very good. Now, extreme ownership, what does that mean? So in law enforcement, you have good days and bad days. We already talked about that, right? right. All right. So when things go wrong... And they will go wrong in law enforcement. There's no doubt about it. It's all about how you handle it. And you can point fingers and you can say, not my fault, not it, didn't do it, whatever it happens to be. But ultimately, when you're in the role of sheriff, the buck stops with you. And even on the bad days, when you know it's not your fault, bad things happen. Stop evaluate what's going on and figure out if there's something you could have done better. And we're all human and we're all imperfect and there's always something we can do better. So look at that, evaluate that, look at best practices from across the country. Most of the time you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you figure out that there's some really good evidence-based practices out there that you could implement or bring in subject matter experts. Know that you are not the expert at everything and bring the right people around the table and don't have an ego that is so big that you can't handle that. So I'm gonna ask a side question here. Is sure. there any one practice you'd like to see changed uh, at the Sheriff's Department? Any specific thing you'd start working at? 
I would say, and I, and, and probably a lot of people from the outside aren't going to get this because they're not from inside the organization, but it is truly giving everybody an equal opportunity and a shot to do what they want in the organization. And that means um, valuing everybody for what they bring to the table, uh, looking back at people's past experiences that they bring from other jobs before they get to the sheriff's office. Because there's a, there's a habit in law enforcement of, you know, you didn't exist until you got here. And we have people with some amazing skills that they bring to the table. Great education. And it tends to get kind of pushed aside or shoved under the rug. And we need to bring those skill sets out and embrace them and put them in the right positions. Well, that sounds like the, the way you get people motivated is that's what you do. So I think, people under, I think people understand that. Make the most of people. Make it that they want to be there because they're contributing. Right. The best type of people work not just for pay. But and I'm sure that you there. dealt with in, in the military of different levels of how people are viewed if they're a civilian employee or they're a commissioned right. employee. Well, law enforcement's no different. I worked in hybrids at the end uh, my last five years, half military, half civilian, sworn both sides, sworn civilian agents. Right. So we were, were interchangeable. So I sort of understand exactly what you're saying. And we had a lot of flexibility. Right. A lot of flexibility. And you need to have that. Yeah, very good. So uh, the other thing is, as we finish up here, I'm going to ask you, are there any books? And you brought a couple books, which is nice, uh, that you would recommend uh, we read. I always like to find out books. So Absolutely. what are your two books? You can hold them up. So uh, one of them is Creating Public Value by Mark Moore. Uh, he works over at the Kennedy School of Government uh, with Harvard. And I had the fortune of actually going back to Boston and going through a three-week three, three week, uh, law enforcement leadership class, Senior Management Institute for Police. And Mark Moore was one of the instructors there. Okay. So uh, he talks about uh, working in the public sector and then how do you intersect with your communities and providing value to what you do uh -huh. in a world of politics where it can be very difficult. So that's kind of the more boring book, you know, okay, but... The one that I find really, really valuable is Now Discover Your Strengths. And that book goes into personality types. And there's 29 different kind of skill sets that people bring to the table. And we all have a tendency as human beings to lean toward about five of them. And you attack most of the things that come across you in life with those five skill sets. And instead of Focusing your time on the things that you're not so good at. They said, focus your efforts on what you're good at. Utilize them to adapt and overcome to the things that you might have weaknesses with. And then once you recognize who you are as a person, surround yourself with teams, coworkers, family, friends that bring the skills that maybe you don't have to make a big cohesive unit and be more successful. So knowing how I'm wired, uh, I know that according to this, that I am big on communication, that I'm an achiever. An achiever doesn't mean what you think it means. What it means is every day my day starts at zero. And I have a checklist of things I need to get done. So I'm constantly never happy with where I am. I'm always trying to, to do more. Another one is a developer. So I believe that everybody is a work in progress, that we all have room to grow, and I focus in on that. Another one is fairness. I think everybody is, you know, puts their pants on the same way, and I don't like it when the squeaky wheel gets the grease. That happens a lot in government. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go into so, that. That's for a different so, story. So those are the things yeah, that, that I, I think are very important. V very good. I know I've heard of the book. Um, i it's a very good book. I think I've listened to parts of it too. So in, in closing, we're going to say, how can the listener get a hold of you? Uh, very simple. Uh, I have a website. So howforsheriff.com. You can write me email, Heidi at howforsheriff.com. And then also you can call me. There's a phone number connected to that. Area code 775-813-8026. Very good. And I always tell people, too, you're busy and you got a lot of calls. If it goes to voicemail, make sure you leave a voicemail because I'm sure you'll call back. Yes. Leave a voicemail, leave a message, write me an email. I'll get back to you. And then finally, we've got one last question. Actually, I have two questions for you. So 
since you're in such great shape, this will lead into the second question. What do you do to stay in shape? Uh, I've always been a fan of lifting weights and good cardio. Uh, I believe in low impact cardio. Why? Because I'm getting older <laughs> and, and my knees won't like it if I do something high impact, but a lot of elliptical. Oh, you do elliptical. Yeah. Do you still run? Uh, not big like on the, not into the running. I'll do the elliptical. Um, what I discovered is uh, over the years, you'd have to go through physical fitness testing and all that mm -hmm. with, with law enforcement. And even though I was doing more elliptical, I could still hit the track and I really didn't lose anything. Yeah, so you didn't have to do the pounding except when you needed it. Right. You I strength. just had to do it when I had to do it. Very good. Very good. And finally, in the Reno area, greater Reno area, Reno Sparks and Washoe County, where are some of the places you like to eat? Mm. So I am a big fan of supporting local businesses. Um, I've been across the country for a variety of conferences. I've been part of a national organization where I had to travel. And people say, oh, come here. The food is great. What I discovered is the food in Reno is actually pretty darn good. It is. And I love going, love going to Pegs for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Now my difficult part is figuring out which Pegs to go to. Because <laughs> I, I actually live out in the North Valley, so now there's one in North Valleys. And I also like going to Italian food over or Mario's Portofino. The people there are fantastic. The food is good. It's a welcoming kind of like home when you come in there. And coffee, I like going to Swill. Yeah, Swill is very nice. So I like Swill and Peter, over. Peter has done a uh, great Peter, job. Peter Krupp is great. Great job. Great over really, there. it was a good place before. Now it's amazing. Yeah. So I love going over there. And let's see, what other places do I like? Um, but I've also gone to the Hub, I've gone to the coffee bar. Mm -hmm. oh, we have a lot of. Oh, Hub is, hub is wonderful. My daughter goes there a lot. Mm -hmm. The problem is so crowded. You know, it weekends. is, it is. And, and then it's also the when river. it's so busy, it also gets pretty noisy there yeah. too. Yeah. And then um, great Thai food over at Bangkok Cuisine. Yep. And then I, I like going to Great Basin. Right. You, you know what's so nice about Reno is we have a, a and we have, that must be in, in law enforcement too, in the weekends, a lot of people show up and then they leave. So we get to enjoy all these amenities and all these great places to eat that are really because of the tourism that comes in here, we get to eat it with our uh, gone. It's wild and the growth that we have going oh, yeah, on here. Huge growth. There are so many restaurants I haven't even had the chance yeah. to try. No, we'll, we'll try to get you back on before the election or for sure, uh, we can probably have a primary. So maybe we can go more detail. And uh, right. there, there's so many things about Reno. We always say, what do you like about Reno? Because I love it here. I've been here five years. It's a oh, wonderful I love place. It. And you've been here much longer than I have. I've been here since 1979. Well, thank you, Heidi. Oh. Hi, this is Bill, and thank you for watching. Go ahead and, if you're not signed in, sign into your Gmail. Go right up here and subscribe to RMC TV. And go over here, watch a couple more videos. Link to our website at republicanmenstclub.org. And finally, make sure you go down and leave a comment. The comments really help. See you on the next video.